We're on week two, lesson 12 of our book, Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Track All of Your Life. So let's go ahead and dive into lesson number 12. Reminder, if you're following the daily YouTube live book study, which I just finished, reminder, wear your engagement and wedding ring while we're doing this book study. And also always take a selfie of yourself for every day that we're doing this live book study. And at the end of our seven weeks together, You'll be able to see the changes in your face. I have to tell you, even though I've invested tens of thousands of dollars on love coaches, life coaches, Tony, uh, I mean, honestly, 3,000 every single January. I always do Tony Rob, Rob, Robbins program every year. Uh, Share Your Love Deepest program is $8,500 alone. Um, and it's interesting that this book is showing me how I still have so many love blocks. Even though I'm a literally professional life and love coach, like it's, it's crazy how much um, how much subconscious prompting this book really helps with. So let's go ahead and get started. Lesson twelve is called renegotiating old agreements. I just finished the daily book study on YouTube Live, and I figured uh, before my meditation practice here in this park, I'll go ahead and share this with you too. I know I said I was going to take a break from social media because I'm like I've been praying about it. And I'm just like so over it lately. So I've decided that instead of making taking a video and editing it in CapCut, the easiest way for me is just to go live because there's zero editing involved. Renegotiating old agreements. Lesson twelve. It says, the first time I was in love, I was 15. Frank was kind and thoughtful. When I was 17, he asked me to marry him. My mother was beside herself. She insisted that I go to college and get a life before committing to someone I had met as a sophomore in high school. In our last year together, we began fighting about the choices I was facing as I turned 18. I wanted to go to college. Frank, however, had decided against college in favor of going into his family's business. He was dead sent against me pursuing an education when he hadn't. No discussion, end of story, and sadly, end, end of relationship. It says, one of the ways that I dealt with my overwhelming sorrow was to make a promise. I couldn't bear the thought that I would never see him again, so I tried to make a deal with Frank. I pledged that we would find each other again when we were in our 60s, when we would have already lived our lives and would be free to reconcile. So 20 plus years later, I had forgotten about this promise, and one night, a month into my quest to call in the one, I remembered this agreement and realized it was somehow always in the background of my life, living like an unfulfilled longing. Those crazy, desperate, young words of passion, spoken in a moment of complete despair and sorrow, were still hanging out there somewhere, waiting to be fulfilled. I hadn't spoken to Frank in all that time, and I was, neg I was reticent to contact him again because I didn't want to harm his marriage. So I settled for speaking to him in a soul-to-soul -soul conversation, calling him in figuratively to my meditation practice. I sat quietly and focused on my breath for a few minutes before silently saying his name several times and imagining him sitting in front of me. I told him that I couldn't keep the promise that I had made to him and why, because it was holding me up from finding love with someone else that I could be happy with and it was preventing me from creating a life where I might not be free when I was in my 60s. I asked him to let me go if he had been holding on to that promise and to please forgive me for not being able to keep it. And then I let him go, freeing myself from the contract that I had made so many years before. All relationships have their agreements, spoken and unspoken. It says, so there was this woman, Nancy, who had a surgery on her throat done when she was two years old. And it says, though Nancy was just a young child when this happened, she remembers being furious at her mother for leaving her at a time when she most needed her. She made a decision at two years old to never trust anyone again. Nancy's mother validated her recollection by admitting years later that their relationship was never the same after that week. Nancy became distant and detached from others in the family from that time on, unwilling to bond on or depend on them to the same extent that she did before the throat operation. It was a resolve that de desperately needed to be renegotiated. So this chapter is all about renegotiating the agreements that we have made in our lives. Uh, all right, lesson 13, appreciating your sacred wounds. So a quote, it says, what do sad people have in common? Well, it seems they all have built a shrine to the past and they often go there to do a strange wail and to worship. What is the beginning of happiness? It is to stop being so religious like that. 
and that is a quote by Hafiz, H-A-F-I-Z. So here's what it says. I'm going to read you a story now, a short story about sexual trauma. So it says, Anessa sat hunched over, rocking back and forth, staring at the floor in front of her. The other women, who were gathered in a calling in the one workshop, sat quietly in the circle, holding space, patiently waiting for Anessa to speak. She said, I can't get past the feeling that I'm dirty. She spoke in a strained, frustrated voice. I'm damaged goods, and I can't seem to forget it, even for a moment. Every single relationship I've ever had just ends up as broken and as damaged as I am. When do I get to get rid of this ugliness inside of me? When do I get to be free? When do I get to have love in my life? By now, tears were streaming down Inessa's face as she recalled being sexually molested by her father when she was a mere four years old. Anessa, do you really believe that you are dirty? As if that's the cold truth about you? As though God made the mountains, God made the sun, and God made you dirty and damaged? I asked softly. Yes, she replied, without needing to think about it. It always comes down to this truth. I am a dirty, dirty person. The author says, I invited Anessa to take a deep breath and tell me some of the best things about herself as an adult woman of 41. She began to share some of her core strengths and competencies. She was a good friend, a loyal employee, and had grown herself spiritually strong over the past years as a devoted practitioner of meditation. Or meditation. As she spoke, she relaxed and began to be centered in her 41-year-old adult self. At this point, I invited her to imagine that she was sitting before a four-year-old girl. I asked her to send love to that sweet girl before inviting her to picture a grown man, her father, a man who we would hope would protect and love her instead of molesting her. What do you think of this little girl? I asked. Would you look at this little girl and say to yourself, what a dirty, dirty little girl. No wonder her father is sexually abusing her. Anessa burst into tears as for the first time she could actually feel her innocence. The foolishness of the belief that she was dirty was finally evident to her. At last, she felt a deep compassion for herself, claiming her blamelessness as the truth of who she was. I am so sick of walking around wounded, desperate for someone to come and fix this for me. Why do I have to carry the burden of this betrayal into every relationship? When can I get rid of it? She asked me with complete trust and simplicity. Well, I said, I don't know that we ever get rid of our woundedness, but we can change our relationship with it. Rather than relate to our hurts and the meaning that we made in response, such as I'm dirty as the truth, we can hold our suffering as an initiation into wisdom, compassion, and depth. We must give up defining ourselves by what happened way back when and stop overly identifying ourselves with the pain that we have suffered at the hands of those who were either too weak, too selfish, or too sick to do it any differently. If we can cast aside the meaning that we made in response to what happened and step outside of our identity of victim, we can also see that the process of healing our wounds can inspire us to heroic heights of nobility and kindness we can create beauty and great goodness for the world. Art, poetry, music, philosophy, and philanthropy are all born from the terrible grace of hardship and hurt. I've learned more about loving relationships from the absence of love than I have from its presence. And that understanding has led to a lifetime of devotion and in many ways is now the best of who I am. This is why your past traumas are your sacred wounds. Because whatever you have suffered the most is where you now have the opportunity to contribute the most. AKA, if you've struggled with suicide, that's how you help other people who are suicidal. If you've had sexual trauma, you can help other people who have sexual trauma. So for me, my core wounds, my sacred wounds, would be mother and father wound, sexual trauma, suicidal depression, maybe manic bipolar, 
so far <laughs> that I can think of. <laughs> um, there's this guy brushing his dog here in the bar. It's so funny. Okay, it says in the book why people don't heal and how they can. Carolyn Miss writes in sharing the sharing of wounds has become the new language of intimacy, a shortcut to developing trust and understanding. Consider the friendships we form based upon what Dr. Miss calls our woundology, where we bond with one another through complaining about our victimization and the sad state of our lives. There's a quote by Rumi and it says, people want you to be happy, so don't keep serving them your pain. So what happens then when one person, out of a commitment to heal, suddenly decides to give up being in the victim position? Oftentimes, such a friendship will not survive a betrayal of this sort, since the silent agreement is to reinforce the oppression of each other. So basically, we have silent agreements, even in our friendships, that we are, have basically, in an unspoken way, agreed that in that friendship, we will reinforce the oppression of each other. So what agreements do you have in your friendships that involve, hey, the place in your friendship is to literally feel bad for me, and I'll, you feel bad for me, and I'll feel bad for you. If one person is broken, then the other gets to prop up their self-esteem by either one, caretaking them, or two, being superior to them. Sometimes women will hold on to a sense of victimization because they're acting out a collective myth of damsel in distress. This, of course, will attract those who source their value from rescuing and men who unconsciously need their lover to stay a bit desperate and dependent in order to feel good about themselves. This traps the damsel in distress in her habitual drama and it covertly sabotages her from escaping it totally as long as we cling to the pain of the past it continues to live and it continues to hurt us in some way suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning our task is to find a way through the ruins so that as we may as the zen saying goes allow our hearts to break open it is here that one not only comes to love again, but also comes to love in a way that heals the entire world. <laughs> God, is, I'm getting cold here in the park. My hands are cold. So that is lesson 12 and 13. So tomorrow we will go on with lesson 14 and 15 on the YouTube live daily book study. So I've been live. I just finished my live on YouTube. It was over an hour and we had like five people engaging and sharing uh, the ways that they came up with their own reflections and their own healing work and their own uh, prompts of the subconscious mind in the chat. So if you want to watch the YouTube live replay, it's on my YouTube channel. Goddess, love you so much and happy Sunday. I will see you tomorrow on YouTube live for the rest of our book study in seven weeks to attract love calling in the one by Catherine Woodward Thomas.